And we'll be hearing from them a bit later on this evening. You're all most welcome here this evening for the fourth in our series of climate conversations. Responding to the challenge of climate change requires a transformative shift in the values of our society. A common rebuttal against taking any climate action is often, why bother? What difference will my contribution make if others don't take action? This session of our climate conversations, we're going to try and explore together the deep wells of inspiration in modern Irish society. How can we tap into them? Where can we go to find the spiritual and ethical motivation that we need in order to face a, a challenge of the magnitude of climate change. The session tonight will bring together people from different faith traditions and spiritual traditions, as well as people from different generations, charting their own path to a climate just world. But before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk about tonight, we want to set our climate conversation tonight in the context of what we've been doing over the past few months. So I'm going to invite Martin to talk us through where we're at now. Thank you, Lorna. And on behalf of the Climate Gathering, you're most welcome here tonight. And thank you to Lorna, to Christ Church, to Sorley McCaughey for organising and hosting tonight's event, which I know is going to be very inspirational and touch those deeper notes of values and inspiration which the challenge of climate change uh, requires because it is indeed a challenge which is perhaps unprecedented in the history of the human family to date and calls for a response of an order of magnitude which other challenges have not called for. So it's really a pleasure to be in the setting and to be hosted by uh, Christian Aid and by Trokra in this lovely venue. And wasn't that a wonderful choir to set us out on that journey of inspiration tonight? Um, it is part of a larger series of conversations, five conversations in all, that began in Liberty Hall. It's a creative series in three parts. In the format of a good creative conversation, it has an opening section, a discovery section, which if the technology works we'll get to see, an opening section, a transformational section, and then the call to action. Uh, our first three 
conversations where The first three conversations were an opening of the space through the lens of how do we communicate the challenge of climate? And secondly, we looked at it through the lens of a new economy, envisioning a new kind of economy that might bring us to a destination that is sustainable and a future that is better than the one we currently have. And lastly, our last conversation in the storehouse was about the sustainable use of our land. So I think we've had, here we are, finally. Thank you to Owen on the, on the technology end. This is a journey in three parts, discovery, reflection, and action. Our first three conversations were the discovery section. Tonight, we retreat and reflect. We drop into a deeper space. We surrender all that is unnecessary and non-essential. We tune into a future that is seeking to be born. And our gospel choir and this venue are ideal settings for doing just that. So I'm not going to delay tonight, apart from saying that, inspired by the vision and the impulses that flow from tonight, we will finalize our conversations in the Abbey Theatre on the 10th of May with a call to new horizons. And what that will look like, I'm not quite sure yet. Because it is a creative process, we're hoping to be surprised and to be inspired what, by what comes out of tonight. So we're looking forward to seeing you in the Abbey on the 10th. But right now, the invitation is to drop into a deeper space and to be willing to be inspired. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. As Martin said, tonight's conversation is all about reflection. It's not so much a conversation with each other, but a re reflection with ourselves. It's about going to a deeper space. It's a conversation that goes beyond the polemics. It's the conversation that comes before the activism. It's about getting in touch with the source, however you define that source the energy force, the God, the spiritual, the inner motivation that motivates you to take action in the world. The evening's going to have three parts. The first part will be an address by Father Sean McDonough, who'll set the context that we're living in. Secondly, we'll hear some testimonies of people who are, feel, who are motivated into action and they'll talk about their personal experience. And then finally, we'll have a moment of commitment from people representing the different religions, the different traditions that are present among us. They'll be asked to come forward and to, to commit. So our first speaker this evening is Father Sean McDonough. Sean is a Colombian priest and an outspoken critic of the policies that allow for systemic degradation of the environment. And he's, throughout his work, he's linked these to global poverty and the increased suffering of the poor, especially in the developing world. It was during his work with the indigenous Tiboli people in the Philippines, on the island of Mindanao in the 1970s and the 1980s, that his understanding of, develop, of environmental and development issues and the relationship between these came to the fore. He's the author of numerous books and articles, including Climate Change, The Challenge to Us All, Greening the Christian Millennium, Caring for the Earth and Dying for Water. He's going to speak to us tonight on the topic of faith, spirituality and climate action. Thank you. So, Lorna, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think this is one of the most important issues that we are facing at the moment, and particularly will face in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is that any spiritual reflection on climate change 
uh, or any moral reflection has to start with what's happening. What is the science of what's happening out there? Not on this other disputed questions. And so that brings me to the two last reports from the Intergovernmental pa Panel on, on Climate Change. Oh my. Uh, the one, number four report is, came out on um, April 6, uh, not 2007. Uh, the Bush administration had been making it very difficult to get an agreement at that time. So it, it, it went two days beyond the time it should have, but actually it ended on what was Good Friday. And when we heard the song here at the beginning, we're talking about resurrection. But it's resurrection out of actually a Good Friday. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a group of scientists that run about 3,000. They go right across the various scientific uh, disciplines. And so what they've come up with is 90% sure that climate change is happening and 95% sure that it is a factor of what humans are doing, burning fossil fuel. That between the end of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago, and the beginning of modern industrialization in, 18, in the 1750s, there was 280 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. Since then, we've gone to 405, 406. In many ways, that's the very simple reason uh, why we're in trouble. The fourth report talked about what we're beginning to see. Now, we're still just below one degree Celsius rise from the time before the last ice age. So, uh, sorry, the time before the Industrial Revolution. So we've only gone a small bit of the way, and yet we see what is happening. Uh, severe weather is, is very significant. Many parts of the world are experiencing it. Uh, I was in the Philippines there last year and went down to, to Tacloban, which is a town where Irish missionaries, the, the, the um, Mercy System Cork, were working there since 1955. The typhoon that came in hit the town at 200 miles an hour. I was talking to people about the impact of that. It was extraordinary. Anything up to eight, maybe nine, 10,000 people were killed in that. But the most extraordinary and awful possibility is that, remember when the Pope went down there last year, he actually also ran, ran into a typhoon. Now, it wasn't number five, it was number three. But the reality is, if number fives are happening every 10 or 15 years, places like that will not be inhabitable, or they will, so much uh, work will have to go into them to make them, uh, to make them in inhabitable, and that will be very difficult. So, uh, floods, uh, if you have a, a one meter rise in sea level, what do you do about the 30 million people in Bangladesh who are just living a one meter above the high water mark? Now the reality is we're probably going to go way beyond one meter. Uh, and, uh, and that will have huge impact on, on Ireland itself, on this city, on Waterford, on Cork, and on Limerick. So things people might be saying, well, we'll, we'll have some bit of... Uh, uh, a benefit from it, things might be warmer, but on the other side, you, will ha you could have extraordinary difficult situations. Uh, typhoons, uh, hurricanes will continue, and, and they'll continue to be stronger and more often and do enormous damage. And we're also seeing that it isn't, although we say one degree Celsius uh, or two degrees Celsius, in many areas it has risen much more, for example, in the tropical area. One of the areas, I remember initially when the discourse around climate change, people talked, well, you have more carbon in the air, you'll have more food. The reality is the opposite. It is having an impact, particularly on rice and wheat production. And so we're getting real concerns about every degree of heat you're going to get is going to make a huge difference to your rice harvest. So in Africa and Asia, you have world populations going up and the ability to feed them going down. So I suppose it is obvious that uh, many people feel that given the extraordinary consequences of this, and also the fact that unless we reverse it within the next 10 or 15 years, we will not be able to change it. And so we will actually have moved, not just in a historical sense, like back here when the Vikings were here, that's a historical change or a cultural change, but we will actually have moved a geological change. We'll be talking about the changes between the Devonian period, uh, the upper Carboniferous period, things that took millions of years to happen. 
can actually and will happen in the lifetime or in, in, within 100 years. If you get a four degree Celsius rise in global temperature, it would transform the Amazon from the rainforest, the extraordinary rainforest it is, into a savanna land in less than 100 years. And that's one of the other awful things about climate change that we don't think of too strongly. That it is actually, it, even a, a two degree rise in climate globally will lead to the extinction of between 30 and 40 percent of all life on Earth. So this would be the biggest change since the 65 million years ago, since the end of the, of the, of the Cretaceous period, uh, when the, the dinosaurs were wiped out. So it's of an extraordinary order of mag magnitude. It needs to be addressed extraordinarily quickly, because as I say, if we are 20 or 30 years off the mark, the kinds of changes, the tipping points we have reached will be irreversible. And because we have lived in a fairly stable climate since the beginning of the agriculture 10,000 years ago, we have no idea of what a, a climate that, that, uh, with severe weather would, would bring. So for that reason, we really have to begin to look at what are the implications of this for our ethical framework. Now, one of the problems with our ethical framework is in most of our traditions, religious traditions, they were devised in a context of my relationship with other human beings and my relationship with God. And that's not wide enough at all today. So one of the first things I would say from a Catholic perspective is this whole notion of the common good. Now, the reality is that's what a society should be attempting to reach, that the context of life in which they live will, in a sense, promote the well-being of a vast majority of people. What, of course, our tradition has forgotten to say is you cannot have that unless you're living in ecosystems which actually support that. So the common good now in the context of climate change reaches out to the, the ecosystems around us because if they change irreversibly, then, of course, you have the kind of impact we've talked about, severe impact on, on peoples and on other species. And they have the same right to their lives into the future as we have. And so I would like to, the, one of the major areas is this notion of the common good, that we seek to pursue it and in a way that will give us a basis on which to, to move forward. A second one of the, the, the moral principles that when I studied theology many years ago just wasn't on the horizon at all. And now it's one of the most important issues and you can see it in the face of young people here, intergenerational justice. Does one generation have the right to do something to the environment that actually brings about these extraordinary changes and then leave it to pass on to the next generation? And so again, it's one of the central pillars of our understanding of dealing with climate change, that we don't have a right to do that. We have serious obligations to those who are coming after us, that they inherit our world as beautiful and as a sustainable as the world in which we inherited from others. And that won't happen if you have climate change uh, taking place, uh, particularly at the extent that we're seeing happening at the moment. So intergenerational justice uh, is very important. Another area that, remember, uh, Pope uh, John Paul II was very strong on was solidarity. But in a sense, again, in his view of solidarity, it was solidarity with other human beings, and that is very, very near, clear and necessary. But the new understanding in the context of something like climate change is solidarity not just with humans, but with all creation around us. Given the understanding, if creation changes irreversibly, it will affect everyone, including humankind. So uh, a final one that I would bring to your notice is... Um, and there's a pathos to this, because uh, the reality is we talked about what happened after the Industrial Revolution, that we began to put the carbon period, the Carboniferous period of 200 million years ago, we began to put that back up into the atmosphere. And it has an extraordinary impact on our lives and has changed our lives in extraordinary ways for the, the top people in the world, starting in Europe, North America, Japan, etc. But that's not going to continue because 
uh, the, the issues that, that we face are absolutely massive in this area. So we have to, to, to think about a new way of living here on our planet Earth. And, uh, and this uh, principle that came to us from Latin America, uh, the concerns for people, is very, very important here. So we need to be very clear about that. So in many ways, we are facing a real crisis. Uh, we need to have a background that looks at the issues from a moral and religious perspective. We need to have the courage to take decisions right now. And uh, the, we're talking about a papal encyclical coming out maybe in, a, in maybe a month or two. But there's a great tra tragedy in our planet at the moment that the most powerful nation on Earth, uh, almost half of the people involved in it, are actually climate skeptics. And that's one of the issues that's going to come from the encyclical, hopefully, that is grounded in the science, but also grounded in the ethical and religious reflections of our tradition, that it will challenge them at the United Nations, and it will challenge them in Congress, to, 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 and show them the kind of very major irresponsibility that they're involved in. Not just for, for uh, the United States, but for all of, mankind, of humankind, and for all of the rest of creation. I remember at one of the climate change conferences, I forget which one it was, uh, someone from Vanuatu said, when do we have to wait for six senators to make a decision in the United States that has an implication for all humanity, and I would say all of life on Earth? And that's the kind, that's the kind of issue that we are facing at the present moment. So, uh, even here in Ireland, of course, we have you know, we, we, we have real issues. You know, the, the amount of carbon we put in as individuals, the kind of policies that are coming uh, in our government. Uh, for example, I was reading uh, Michael Viney's column in the Irish Times uh, on last Saturday, and he talked about this, the new food harvest for 2020 and the hype that goes with it. Acting smart and thinking green without any realization how this will affect the environment. And he talks about the the IFA chairman in County Mead said that to do this, we will need 300,000 extra cows here in our country. So how are we going to factor that into a, a serious reduction in, in, in climate change uh, uh, over the next uh, number of years? So at the local level, uh, I think we need to connect our discourse with action. And I think one of the actions that's been taken at the moment, I think is very helpful, is the World Council of Churches have come in behind it. The Anglican Communion, as of two weeks ago, came in behind it, their environmental committee uh, of divestment from fossil fuel industries. And I'd hope it's something that the Catholic Church will take on board very clearly, that, uh, that investing in something that's doing enormous damage to the future uh, certainly isn't what... Um, our religious traditions would want us to be involved in. I would like to see the encyclical or some of this kind of material making its way into the parishes and dioceses of the various religious traditions here. Because unless it does that, in a sense, it won't have the pressure, uh, it won't be able, uh, the sustainability, to bring about the kind of change that we need to see happening. And the changes uh, we, be, we ne really need to see, for example, in our climate bill, targets, realistic targets, because the targets we have at the moment are very unrealistic. I was reading a thing last, last week on the um, New York Times that pointed out that if we burn the carbon that's fairly easy available to us, it will mean a rise in 16.5 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the next 30 to 40 years. Now, that actually would be way beyond the kind of things that, that, that the climate scientists are talking about. When you go above four, four degrees Celsius, they're basically saying the kind of changes that are going to take place certainly will be in a geological order of magnitude, and our ability to deal with it would be very, very much less, less indeed. So, I suppose, to go back to our moral principles, the, the common good being one that we would pursue, for the well-being of humans, the well-being of creation. Uh, our concern also 
for future generations that we pay the same attention or give the same attention to uh, the next generations and we don't leave them with a world that will be very, very difficult to live in uh, and that the choices that they have will be very, very little. Uh, that we have that solidarity uh, that is concerned about just, not just our concern for fellow human beings, but our solidarity that sees humans embedded in vibrant uh, life systems that if they're affected, then that implications will continue uh, uninterrupted for, uh, for the, for into what could very well be a geological order of magnitude. Uh, in 2011, the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences, they brought out uh, a document called The Fate of Mountain Glaciers, what will be happening in the glaciers of this world, in the Anthropocene. So they showed at, in, at that particular uh, meeting that they were very, very well aware that what we were doing was actually of that order of magnitude. And that's something extraordinary. It's not just, as we said, a historical order of magnitude. It's an order of magnitude that uh, in the evolution of our planet over the last 500 million years, some of them took 30 million, 40 million years to be achieved. And now in a very, very short period of time, uh, we could have that kind of change taking place. So uh, I would my, myself like to see the churches taking this as one of the most serious issues of our time and being part of the discourse at parish level, at diocesan level, at its teaching, at offering challenges where people may or may not invest their money so that uh, it would be uh, a central issue and, and the churches would be seen to be very much involved in this. Something that I'd have to say until the moment, well, hasn't been the case. I mean, I would say ask you how many of you over the period even of the last two or three years would have ever heard a, a sermon on climate change? Hmm? One person that has. Never. never. Well, if, if, if it is that serious of an issue and it demands the kind of focused attention uh, that other serious issues give, it's something that we should be taking very seriously. And bringing together our moral uh, and our spiritual traditions to it to help us to design a world that is sustainable into the future. And in a sense, that's one of the last of the moral principles that, that a sustainable world uh, is the, the kind of world that uh, we'd like to work for, but in many ways it has been undermined by the fossil fuel industry itself. Because the more we, 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 we use fossil fuel, the, the more we put up into the atmosphere. Now we're beginning to realize what an extraordinary impact it would have on us. So my focus on this would be to say this is a very serious issue. It's an issue that needs to be addressed uh, in a very urgent way and in a very concerted way. And in many ways, it still hasn't got the glue of a social um, agreement among people with something of a moral and religious uh, focus behind it to bring about that kind of change. Because so very often we just discuss the economic uh, reality, what it will mean for us economically, and not think through the, more, the larger context of the change that will happen and its impact right into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I think you've really brought home the, the seriousness of the issue. I think your final comment there is just is so relevant to the climate conversations around the social glue, and they need to reflect on what that social glue is. And, we're, and part of what we're trying to do tonight and with this climate conversations is to examine the social glue that binds us together. We're going to have a song now from um, Alan Savant.
house of pomegranates Wish only, my love We shall die In a heat of morning lights In a heat of morning lights And we breathe, lying by the sea and we cry, waiting for love. In a house of pomegranates, dreams in our lives, and we are poor with golden heart, sweet as a dolphin, you'll be my queen, singing the song of the death of a perfect soul. In the house of pomegranates, we shall live, my love. We shall die in the heat of morning lights. In the heat of morning lights. And we breathe, lying by the sea. And we cry, waiting for love. In a house of pomegranates, we're falling stars like naked slaves. We know the ways, and we will find we are not blind. We are the birds in the mind of this perfect child. In a house of pomegranates. In a house of pomegranates, my love.
Thanks for that, Alan. That was great. We now come to the second part of our evening, where we're going to hear from different people who are trying to um, trying to apply some of their own thinking in trying to address climate change from different faith traditions. As Father Sean said, the, the scale of the challenge is so enormous, and one of the reactions to that is often paralysis. It's often a sense of, well, how, where do you start? What can you do? But there are many things we can do, and often we just need to turn our attention away from the fear and away from the sense of paralysis towards what we can actually do to make a difference and to make a change. So the first contribution we're going to hear from is actually um, on a video. So if we could have the screen. And Sean talked, um, mentioned the whole idea of... Hello, um, my name is Gunala Hahn. It's already started. Uh, <laughs> Divestment from fossil fuels. And one of the churches that has really made an advance on this is the Church of Sweden. So uh, we asked them if they could contribute to this evening's uh, conversation. So we're going to hear from uh, Gunella Han, uh, who's working on investment with the Swedish church. And uh, I work with the Church of Sweden uh, with investment. I'm going to have responsible investment. And um, I will tell you a little bit. Hello. Um, my name is Gunella Han, and uh, I work with the Church of Sweden uh, with investment. I'm head of responsible investment, and um, I will tell you a little bit today about um, our work on fossil fuels and climate. So, uh, just some short uh, words about the Church of Sweden. It's a um, it used to be a state church, <clears throat> so um, um, almost everybody in the in Sweden was member of the church. Today, uh, we have six and a half million people still as members. That is uh, two thirds of the Swedish population. And uh, the membership fee is actually paid through the tax system uh, today, still. Uh, and so there are many people involved in how the Swedish church should be run. Also the financial assets how they should be placed. Uh, so we have a very um, ambitious financial policy uh, that states that we should be very responsible, responsible investors. We have a fossil fuel criterion, uh, which says, yeah, first of all, that we should invest in those who are good at energy efficiency and renewable energy that provide us with solutions, okay? Then we say no to oil and gas, all oil and gas companies that extract or explore uh, resources from, from the earth. And we say no to oil sands, uh, to shale gas, uh, if, it's, uh, if the effects are similar to those of oil sands. And then when it comes to utilities, we say that um, the asset manager, managers that we hire should look for best in class. Uh, so, you know, utilities that are good at renewable energy are, are on their way of uh, positioning themselves from fossil fuels to renewables. And we did this because um, of two reasons, both for ethical reasons and for financial reasons. We started with ethical reasons. In 2008, uh, our Archbishop had a climate summit for spiritual leaders. Uh, it was just before the Copenhagen negotiations uh, on climate change. And uh, since the church was very active on uh, climate policy um, making and, and telling politicians that they should be tougher in, when setting reduction targets, uh, we thought that we have to be aligned also in the investment, uh, the investment part of the church. So we started a process of divesting. Uh, first of all, we looked: can we really do this without harming um, the, the the return? So we made a three-year backtracking just to see if that would show anything. 
we looked three years back and could see no really no effect on, on performance the financial return was still the same so that gave us courage to to really do this uh, uh, divestment and uh, the year after us, we understood that this is also really about managing risk the carbon risk you know risk of stranded assets um, we already know that two thirds of all the assets in the ground, carbon assets, need to be need to stay there, if we should have a chance to 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 um, limit the heating, the global heating, on under two degrees. So, stranded assets and and is already it's already here. You know, coal. The coal industry has a lot of problems, and we are not invested in them. Then we had the BP catastrophe in the Gulf, Mexican Gulf, we didn't have BP. And the falling oil prices don't affect us. And, and so there are so many reasons, financial reasons, uh, for not, not, not to have these companies. And we can really see that um, in our performance. The last three years, uh, our returns, financial returns, were better than, much better than the index that we, you know, that we uh, has the indices that we have as benchmarks and in the future I think it will be even harder to be investing in these companies with big risks of stranded assets so I think it's also I mean it's as and as for for a value driven organization like a church it also makes good sense uh, to divest from these companies and invest in the others. There are so many other companies to choose between. Why should you go with these? Hello, um, my name is Gunnela Hahn, and uh, I work with the Church of Sweden uh, with investment. I'm head of responsible investment, and um, I will tell you a little bit today about um, our work on fossil fuels and climate. So, <laughs> no, I'm afraid I'm talking what I'm about what I'm doing myself. Um, Right, well, when I would say a word about Eco Congregation Ireland. Um, Eco Congregation Ireland is a church's environmental organisation strongly supported by UK Eco Congregation um, groups, where, where it's very strong, particularly in Scotland. And um, what they're trying to do is to make the churches more environmentally aware and more environmentally active and really being very successful. I used to be on their committee as the Quaker representative, but now I've been relegated to just doing a few bits of contract work, like assessing an, a, a church for an environmental award now and again, and a, a, an event such as this. So, um, but it's a great organization. Now, this evening I was asked to, I was given three questions to answer. Um, why is acting on climate change important to me? What are the aims and how do I feel about it? And what are my hopes for climate change in the future? But I decided I wouldn't start with any of those. I'd start by <laughs> telling you a little about, about what I'm doing myself and why I'm doing it. I'll go, I'll go back to them later. Um, well, first of all, I'm actually, I come from the conviction that if you're looking at sustainability and trying to make your own household sustainable and, and your own neighbourhoods sustainable in a small way, you know, the local, what you do yourself, you know, my, myself and my own sustainability, that the most efficient unit for, for sustainability is the, the local village community, your local community or your parish or something like that. And... Um, so that is where I'm putting most of my energy at the moment. It's, it's, you know, progress is very slow. It feels like you're doing very little. But I do feel it is the right thing to be doing, and I'm doing that. Um, for example, we're very basic, you know. My husband and I have hens, and we have a garden. And we sell our vegetables, vegetables locally. And the people that come to our door to get the vegetables and the eggs, they realize 
that you don't have to go to the supermarket for everything, that it is possible to grow them yourself and to rear animals yourself and to look after them. We're lucky we live in the country where we have land and our neighbours have land that they let us, let us overflow into. And also, we're getting to know the people, we're getting to know our neighbours who come to the door. It's Neighbours don't always know each other. And also... Um, when I do the, my veg round up on the local housing estate, a new housing estate, I find myself introducing neighbours to each other because I've knocked on all the doors and I know all the people, <laughs> but they don't know each other, you know. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the really important things, I think, for people to do if wherever you are is to get to know your neighbours. You're missing out so much not knowing them. Um, Another thing I do is I'm involved in Cork's local currency, um, Corklets. It's a county-wide currency. And I really believe um, that the local currencies, I wish we could expand Cork's currency to the whole of Ireland, gives an opportunity... <laughs> yeah. ..gives an opportunity for people to create their own employment. And also... Um, I'm sure that if local currencies were properly embraced and, embraced and properly used, there's huge potential for meaningful occupation because I think full employment is a thing of the past. But if people have meaningful occupation and people without employment and without meaningful occupation are a dangerous commodity to have around, I feel. Um, and, and also, you can have a very good lifestyle by... By, by working on the local currency system. You need your euros, euros as well. Don't, 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 I'm not that naive. Um, and you get wonderful friends from... It's quite a different type of trading. I sell a lot of my vegetables for local currency. Um, the third thing that I do is I make biochar. I make biochar um, in my little room heating stove in my sitting room. Biochar is ground up charcoal, and biochar can make two blades of grass grow where only one grew before. It also has huge potential as a, as a, for sequestering carbon in the ground. If, you're, if you have something quick growing, which you make into biochar, and then put it out into your garden, it improves your garden, and it very quickly takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere, into the biochar, into the ground, and it is sequestered there for at least a thousand years. Ordinary compost, it, it migrates back to the air in about five to ten years. And, but I won't say any more about that because it's my favourite topic. <laughs> but I do have leaflets at the, on the trocar table at the back of the hall, so if you haven't already got one, they look like this. Please take one home with you. Um, I leave that time. What? Two minutes. Oh dear. <laughs> um, why am I doing this? I'm a Quaker and a committed Christian. We're told that the two great commandments are to love God and your neighbour as, as yourself. For me, that's a no-brainer. Um, loving God for me means minding his creation and loving my neighbour means keeping an eye out for him and not, put, not putting out so many addition, emissions that his delta or his low-lying island is flooded or that their, de, that their desert home is hopelessly killed, knocked by drought. Um, and also... In our Quaker tradition, George Fox, our founder, exhorted us to be patterns or examples in all countries, wherever we go, that our carriage of life may preach among all sorts of people. I hope that I, by attempting to live sustainably, I might be an example to others. Um, I'm going to have to jump over that bit. <laughs> Lastly, going back to community, I'd like to mention Alistair McIntosh, um, introduced to me by the St. Louis Sisters. He speaks hugely of community and rekindling community. He spoke of his life as a boy in the Isle of Lewis 
and how they, if the storms were there, they, everybody just, life continued as usual. Everybody had enough, enough of what they needed instead of just having a supermarket and the shelves being empty. He was, he, he, his, great, his great phrase is rekindling communi community and regeneration of community. Remembering, revisioning, reclaiming, old-fashioned Christian generosity, reconnecting people together with, with the elements and with each other, belonging. What are my aims for the future? Um, I hope that we will all begin to get the process right, to do the right thing. Whatever the outcome will be, we cannot, we cannot have control over. But the thing to do is to start now to do the right thing. Um, and then lastly, what do other people think of what I'm doing? I think they regard me as being a little bit amusingly daft. That was just fantastic. I... We don't think you're daft. But I think that really just showed the interconnectedness of when you start to take the environment seriously, take the message of faith in connecting with the environment, with neighbours, how it brings you closer to other people as well and builds community. I mean, it was just a wonderful experience there. I'm going to ask Amy to come up now. Amy Colgan. And Amy's been involved in an initiative that Trocra has um, started over the past couple of years called the Climate Change Challenge. So she'll tell us all about it and what it's meant for her. Hi, thank you. Yes, so my name's Amy. I'm from Dublin. I'm 17 years old. And uh, I had the wonderful opportunity last year to be part of Trocra's Climate Change Challenge Weekend. Um, just a bit about me before I go into it. So I, ever since I found out about climate change in first year secondary school, it's been something I've, always, I've been really interested in and I wanted to do something about it. And those two words are really important for me because we have this motto in my house, which is something is better than nothing. So the other week when me and my brothers and sisters were fighting over who got who was the rightful owner of the last Easter egg? It was having something is better than having nothing. And when it comes to being active in the fight for climate justice, it's doing something is better than doing nothing. So when I heard about it, and especially in the context of when something's wrong, when you see something wrong, doing something is better than nothing. And the thing about it is you do something and you keep doing something until it's right. And that's kind of what I've been raised with. So when I heard about climate change and all the impacts of it. I mean, Father Sean was talking about a lot of the impacts of it. And if you've never heard about climate change before in your life, just from listening to him, you can understand how severe they are and how they're already affecting us. So to me, when I heard about it, and it's really just skimmed over in school, I thought, well, that's something that's really wrong, so we should do something about it. And then in TY, I, got, I joined this organization called Eco UNESCO, who run TY programs and secondary school programs. So I joined with a lot of other young people, same age as me, and we got together on a lot of projects, and we got to do a lot of work and learned about the environment and learned about the intricacies and the interconnectivity of all these issues regarding climate change and what we could do about it. And through them, I got this amazing opportunity to go on a three-day climate change challenge conference with 30 other teenagers from around Dublin with Trocra. It was hosted in Maynooth, and we did so many different workshops on a lot of the, the physical impacts of climate change, like deforestation, biodiversity loss, habitat loss, uh, rising sea levels, everything. Um, but we also did a lot about the political and economical context of, of climate change, which we haven't really touched on before. Um, it was very, very interesting, and I learned so much. Um, but one of the biggest things that stood out for me over that weekend was the human impact of climate change. So there was this one workshop we did, and we were kept in the dark. We didn't know what was going to happen that day in particular. But 
We came downstairs and they told us we're going to do this activity, it's a simulation, just go with it. If you need to stop at any time, it's okay, just, just tell us there's a safe word, you know, but just go with the simulation for as long as you can. And we were given these fake identities and money and this whole story. And we were told, you know, there's been flooding, you're going to have to leave. And we were, we were, the whole day we spent doing this simulation and it was very, it was very much an eye opener because it was, it was so well done and professionally done and we really got to see what it was like to be a climate migrant. So we were given these roles of refugees who were being displaced from our homes and we had to leave and there was no chance of us ever coming back and all the, the hardships we had to endure over that one day. But the most horrifying moment was when we came back to reflect on it and I just had this moment of realisation where I kind of went... Well, you know, that was a really, really interesting game. But somewhere this, this very moment, somewhere else in the world, it's not a game. Someone, somewhere else in the world is going through what I went through a hundred times worse, and it's not a game. They don't get to say, I'm sorry, this is too much for me right now. Can I take a break? And it was at that point where up until then, I had rationalized everything. You know, when you read about something and you see the statistics, it's not the same as actually being one of those statistics. And that was kind of my hallelujah moment when I said, okay, you know what? I actually need to take this a lot more seriously than I am right now. So from that moment on, I've, I'm still feeling the impacts of it. I can't buy something without looking at who's been involved in making this. Where has this product come from? What's the situation like in the place where this product is being made? How has it gotten to where it is on the shelves? I can't engage in a service without thinking about all the steps that went until, th that have come along all the way until I get to use it. So it's something that's always been in my mind since that very moment. And I, I'm really grateful to Troker for allowing me to experience that. Um, what I've done since then is gone a level further with all the projects I'm engaging in. It's only been about six months since the project, but it's changed my, my whole life. So. I've kept in touch with everyone else who went along to the conference and we've been trading ideas about products that we can do and, and ways that we can make a subtle change in the world we live in to do something. And I've been involved in, in projects regarding fracking, sustainable development, uh, water scarcity, water security, food security and recently, I, I'm just after finishing working on a project with a bunch of my friends in Eco UNESCO about the connections between gender inequalities and climate change. Because through further research and further exploration of these topics, we discovered that women are disproportionately affected by climate change because they don't have the same access to resources that men do. And it's, there's so many different intricacies that if you I deal with one topic in isolation, you're never going to get to the bottom of it. And it's something that I really only fully realized from that weekend I spent with Trokra. And it really helped give me the skills I needed to help go further and become more of an activist and become more involved with doing something. So a lot of the skills that we touched on that weekend were things like teamwork skills, presentation skills, which I'm really thankful for right now. <laughs> um, how to come solution to, to uh, collaborative solutions and how to try and see something from someone else's perspective. I really, really hope that going forward, you'll take the words, something is better than nothing, and use that in whatever way you can apply it to in your life, to do something and keep doing something until that something has become right. Thank you. Amy, I think that applause tells you that people heard you and that something is definitely better than nothing. Our final testimony is from Melanie Clark, sorry, Melanie Clark Pullen, who's described here, I don't know if this is a description you gave yourself, as an actor, writer, speaker and mum. So, Melanie. I don't really know how to follow that. I'm feeling a little bit nervous. I've got notes. 
I am a mother to a daughter and two sons. My daughter is seven, and my sons are four and one. So if there was ever proof needed that God exists, it's the miracle that I'm here tonight. <laughs> my daughter, Grace, is feisty, determined, and she has no inhibitions about taking up space for and using her voice. She's loud, outspoken, and she has very st a strong sense of justice. Her favorite phrase at the moment is, it's not fair. And usually it's in relation to something she feels her brothers are getting that she is not, or some chore she's, she's been asked to do, and she see her, sees her brothers not doing their bit. Sometimes she's right, and sometimes she needs to be reminded that, you know, the baby's only one, and he doesn't really get the concept of tidy up. We love springtime. And when the sun starts to shine and the air war warms up, we all get excited because it means it's time to sow our seeds in the raised beds we have in our back garden. Grace is especially fond of growing her own food. She delights in choosing the vegetables we're going to grow, sowing the seeds, watering the beds, and she gets so excited at the first signs of growth. She even goes so far as to try the finished products. Handy tip, if you want your kids to eat veggies, grow them yourself. A couple of years ago on a late summer's evening, way past her bedtime, we got down together and pulled up potatoes. Her joy at finding another and another and another, and look, a big one. We sat together and marveled at our hoard as we watched a beautiful sunset. And I can still see her ecstatic little face as she marveled at the colors of the sky. I confess, I'm no expert on climate change. I can't quote facts and figures. I know things don't look good. I know there's a lot of complacency and apathy about the issue. And I know that the impact on our global neighbors is devastating. And I know that unless we do something, my daughter could turn to me in 20 years, those blue eyes flashing with anger and demand of me, why didn't you do something? How did you think you could carry on living as you do? It wasn't fair. Another thing I'm trying to teach my children is what the kingdom of God looks like. We've just celebrated Easter and meditated on the death and resurrection of Jesus when everything changed. The kingdom came. The veil of separation was torn in two and we were given a new creed. Jesus is Lord. This was in direct opposition to the manifesto of the empire that the followers of Jesus lived under at the time, which was Caesar is Lord. Caesar represented the Roman Empire where might money and power were lauded, and resistance was suppressed to the death. As citizens of the kingdom of God, the early church believed in the goodness of God, the abundance of the spirit, and this freed them to love their neighbor and their enemy, to care for those in need, and preach the good news of grace. They believed and lived the teaching of Jesus that those who mourn, the meek, the pure in heart, those who thirst for justice, the peacemakers, they will be blessed. So they put the last first, they healed the sick, they reached out to the rejected and those considered unclean. They became the body of Christ, God with skin on. Their way of living brought them persecution and death, but this did not stop them because they belonged to a kingdom that was eternal. Jesus rose from the dead to announce that not even death could overcome the kingdom of God. We as Christians may believe that death is not the end of the story, but that doesn't mean that we can sit back and wait for pie in the sky when we die, to let it all go to hell in a handbasket in the hope that Jesus will swoop back and get us all the hell out of here. If anything, we have a greater responsibility to announce the good news of the kingdom. The good news of God's favor being on the poorest of the poor. The good news that God sees those suffering the catastrophic impact, impact of climate change in the world. It's our family that are affected, our brothers and our sisters, for we are all made in the image of God. And in the words of my seven-year-old daughter, it's not fair. It's not fair that last year in Bolivia, 350,000 people had to leave their homes 
because of the Amazon flooding due to some of the worst rains in 40 years. It's not fair that in Ethiopia, people who are already hard pressed are having to walk eight hours a day to get water during the dry season. It's not fair that chaotic weather patterns hit struggling people hardest. It's not fair that when we can do something about it by taking action against climate change, that we don't. We in the developed world are the privileged, the ones with the loudest voices. So it's up to us to speak up for the family, for our brothers and our sisters. It's up to us to look at how we live, to think about how complicit we are in the systems that allow the earth to be exploited beyond what it can bear. It's up to us to ask whether we are truly living in the kingdom. It's up to us to raise our children to care for God's good creation so that 20 years from now, we can look them in the eye and say, no, it wasn't fair. So because we were Christians, because we believed that Jesus died and rose from the dead to show a better way, we took action. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you for that. That was just beautiful. We're now going to have a moment of reflection, personal reflection for each of us. Underneath your seats, you'll find a card, as there has been at every climate conversation so far. And there isn't really a question to ask for this card. It's really just to, to give you the opportunity to write down the things that are coming into your mind tonight as we're here gathered together. What is it meaning for you? What, what, what are you hearing from the conversations tonight? So I'm going to give you a few moments to do that. And um, Fiona is going to play the harp while we're reflecting.
So I will have an opportunity, if anybody would like to share some, some of their own reflections on what they've heard tonight. There's no pressure on anybody, but if anybody feels moved, moved by the spirit or moved to, to share their thoughts, you can feel free, right at the back. We have, if you speak with the roving mic, there's a gentleman right at the back. Is somebody Sorley or Martin? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hadn't really intended speaking, um, but having read recently um, George Marshall, he, I think he was due to be one of the speakers in this series and couldn't make it. But I read his book, and um, some I think one part, apart from the four degrees um, that we're, we're heading for that aspect, I think one of the parts that quite affected me was um, his findings or the findings of people he was quoting um, that the world is characterized now with a very deep pessimism, including among children to a very scary extent. And um, but I'm a very poor Christian. I'm kind of returning to <laughs> after many years as I, what I thought was um, an atheist. But um, I... You know, I remember thinking uh, recently in a conversation with a neighbor, um, okay, I'm sorry, um, that, you know, St. Paul said, and I'm probably going to misquote it, but, you know, he mentioned faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these being charity. Um, I think today, perhaps, to meet the moment, a moment that St. Paul probably couldn't have imagined, an existential threat that we we, we face, um, that perhaps faith groups, including the churches, should focus on moving hope up to the top of the list because I have found hope. I was involved in a campaign a couple of years ago and I was bouncing between optimism, I'm just going to finish now, optimism and pessimism, which was wrecking my head, but I found hope as a better motivator and g gave me peace. So I think I'm wondering what the faith groups can do to market hope. There's a big market for it out there, I think. Thank you very much. And sorry if I spoke too long. But, no, um, thank you. I needed to. Thank you. One person over here, then a gentleman at the front, and then there's two more. See, all the women gave the testimonies, now all the men want to speak. Thank you very much. Connor Scott is my name. Um, brought up a Catholic, I have to say, but um, very moved by the contributions of all of the speakers. Thank you all very much. A uh, very inspiring. But just one small thing. It is okay to be an atheist and an environmentalist as well. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, this gentleman here. And then here. Thank you. Uh, actually, I just want, there is a verse in the Holy Quran. Uh, I just picked it up from my memory in chapter 30. This chapter called Rome, Roman, Roman Empire. Because uh, God said in this that. Uh, Persian uh, conquered Roman Empire in the time of about 10th century, but after a couple of years, the Roman Empire conquered the Persian again. And God said before that, by a couple of years in the Quran, the beginning of this chapter, that Roman will conquer the Persian again in a couple of years, and it happens. Uh, verse number. 41 in this chapter, the Quran, Holy Quran says, the tongue by, uh, from God Almighty, corruption has appeared in the land and sea, for that men's own hands have earned it. 
that he may let them taste some parts of that which they have done that happily so they may return. Thanks. Uh, just very briefly, I think the crunch has come for people who believe in the spirit and believe that there can't be any compromise between the ideas of the spirit and the world or materialism, as we call it now. And I think in the early Christian church, it was possible for people to see that and to say rather clearly, for example, the rich man is a thief. But we started to compromise, and the big dramatic compromise, of course, was with Constantine and the ideas of the world. And we've managed to fudge and stumble along with that. But the crunch has come, and that became clear to me in reading Naomi Klein's book, when she said that the oil companies and the coal companies have now enough in reserve to push us past the two degree limit. But she said they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to do exactly that. And that's the truth. In the ethics of that system, their obligation is to extract the oil and destroy the environment. And that's why the crunch has come and we can't compromise with them. And we have to say, it must stop. You must start to stop now. I'll take one final comment up here. If, if then, I could just abuse my position here. On the question of the fiduciary duty, we actually, as Christian Aid, hired legal opinion on that. And their fiduciary, fiduciary duty is not to generate revenue or profit at any cost. They must factor into uh, the equation environmental responsibility and uh, other factors as well. So it's not fiduciary duty to, to generate profit at any cost. And that's a, a, a distinction that must be made. And we must use that to kind of leverage through, through uh, movements like the divestment movement to enforce that kind of pressure on companies. in this instance to the environment. They can be encouraged not to do it, they can be spoken to, but the drive of that system is to extract the oil. Okay. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Niall. I'm a student of climate science, uh, humanitarian logistics and emergency management. Just two points. Um, firstly, I'm delighted to hear um, particularly Father McDonough tonight, um, a man of the church, engaging with science, engaging with geology, referring back to 500 million years of geological history in his speech, and I really thought he was fantastic tonight. Um, secondly, um, to Amy, who spoke tonight, um, I found in her speech, and it was, it was common to other young speakers as we had in Trinity, that even, even if you can't remember what Amy said after this talk, what you felt in her, what she was saying, what, what, what you could hear was enthusiasm. I think that's the difference in young people um, when, when, when they discover climate change and, as Amy said, they want to do something about it. And just, just listen to actual political leaders or other such leaders who actually have the power. Listen to their tone of voice. They're more downbeat. They're talking about financial woes and so on. We all need to have that, that same enthusiasm to actually make a change here. Um, and it was, you know, it was that same kind of enthusiasm when I was Amy's age that got me into studying climate science. So I think taking that point away is something worth thinking about.
We've now come to the third moment on, uh, of our evening, where I'm going to invite the representatives from the different religious traditions uh, to come up to the front. We've spoken to a few people in advance, so you know who you are. If you want to come up and um, you can gather around. So I think this evening we've said that addressing climate change requires us to, to come together to face this common challenge. I think um, it was put very well by Natalie when she said that we're one human family and we need to recognise that the people who are suffering from this and the planet, it's our family and the planet is our home. So at the end of this evening, I'm going to ask each of the different traditions to place a stone from outside this plate into, into the plate and to build a cairn together and to just say a few words of commitment, of hope, of what they want to see going forward from tonight. I'll start from this end. Hello. Um, Francis Martin, I'm representing the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We are a member of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. And we have contacts all over the world. As all of you have here, uh, different faith communities, you're involved with people on an international level. Now, just uh, on Saturday, I met a young student in Dublin who is from India. And he, um, we know India well, and we know people who know him. Can you and, just hold your mic, sorry. But he couldn't wait to tell us that the temperature in Ahmedabad in Gujarat is 41 degrees. But the other day, they had a hailstone shower. And he showed us pictures of the streets that are white. This happened one day, and then about a fortnight later, a second day. This had never happened before. Now, I would just like to maybe encourage you to talk with people, to tell your story from other parts of the world where people have seen extraordinary events. Share th their stories with you so that people get talking and people are aware of what is going on. Because maybe, as someone said earlier, we're a bit paralyzed by all of this. But I think, share your story, get talking, and um, pass it on. I'm Elizabeth Kelly, and I'm from the Methodist tradition. Now, Francis has just told you to share the story. Now, we Methodists love to share the songs. So I'm sure many of you know many songs, but there was one particular Methodist hymn writer called Fred Pratt Green, and he's written quite a number of hymns on this particular thing, on climate change. So I'm going to read two verses from that. God in his love for us lent us this planet, gave it a purpose in time and in space, small as a spark from the fire of creation, cradle of life and the home of our race. Earth is the Lord's, it is ours to enjoy it. Ours as his stewards to farm and defend. From its pollution, misuse and destruction, good Lord deliver us, world without end. Thanks. Uh, I agree with the lady. Uh, it's not anymore climate change. It's a sort. It's it's a disorder. Very uh, disorder going on in the earth, which is uh, which is come and cope with the verse I told you. It's it's corruption. It's dis disruption in the earth. So we need to come back to God. We need to to obey God so that He make the earth friendly with us because God owns everything. I uh, uh, gladly, 
I read to you uh, three verses of the Holy Quran, Arabic, and then English, let you hear the Quran as it is read, read in English. <laughs> إن ربكم الله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش ثم استوى على العرش يغشي الليل النهار يطلبه حثيثا والشمس والقمر والنجوم مسخرات بأمره ألا له الخلق والأمر تبارك الله رب العالمين ادعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفية إنه لا يحب المعتدين ولا تفسدوا في الأرض بعد إصلاحها وادعوه خوفا وطمعا إن رحمة الله قريب من المحسنين and this verse uh, this is from chapter uh, Chapter number six, chapter number six, verses 54 up to 56 in English translation. Indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And then he rose over the throne really in a manner that suits his majesty. He brings the night as a cover over the day seeking it rapidly and he created the sun the moon the stars subjected to his command surely his is a creation and commandment blessed be allah the lord of the mankind jinns and all that exists invoke your lord with humility and in secret he likes not the aggressors and do not do mischief in the earth after it has been set in order and invoke him and fear and hope surely allah's mercy is ever near onto the good uh, onto the good doors thanks Hi, uh, my name is Liz Evers, and I'm here representing the Triratna um, Buddhist um, community here in Dublin. Uh, so I'd like to just read a very short quote from the Buddha. Uh, whatever you think, sorry, whatever you frequently think and ponder upon, that will become the inclination of your mind. So we live in a uh, very frenetic world full of material distractions. This is not the Buddha now, this is me. Um, and so many people uh, don't have the mental space, the concentration required uh, for facing something as big or as real as climate change, to take the time to stop and to think. But that's pre precisely what we need to do. Uh, we must stop and we must think and we must urge others to do the same. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Fiona Murdoch and I'm here representing the Religious Society of Friends, more, more often known as Quakers. And I'm just going to read a few sentences from a statement that was put together by Quakers from all over the world last year. We seek to nurture a global human society that prioritizes the well-being of people over profit and lives in right relationship with our earth. A peaceful world with fulfilling employment, clean air and water, renewable energy, and healthy, thriving communities and ecosystems. As members of this beautiful human family, we seek meaningful commitments from our leaders and ourselves to address climate change for our shared future, the Earth and all species, and the generations to come. We see this earth as a stunning gift that supports life. It is our only home. Let us care for it together.
Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Riley, and I'm here on behalf of St. Finian's Lutheran Church on Adelaide Road. I have a statement here. Um, the Lutheran Church in Ireland embraces creation theology and hopes to spread the message of Christ with raised awareness of climate change and increased consideration of our role as stewards of God's many treasured gifts. Our new Luther House Community Centre and Garden were built accordingly and in appreciation with these gifts, with bright open spaces and energy-saving, eco-friendly elements. In all our efforts, such as this building and participation in things like tonight, we remain humbly aware that we must be completely reliant on the Holy Spirit, who, as the ancient hymn has it, renews the face of the earth. Believing that there is a power beyond us and within us that draws us to a better, higher humanity. We face our uncertain and perilous future, relying on God's spirit to direct and to move and to continue in the work of creation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stella Xenopoulou. I, I'm here on uh, behalf of the Greek Orthodox community in Ireland. We're a small, still a small community. But, uh, and I don't know what it will happen if um, our uh, Minister of Finance follows Natasha's uh, example of uh, um, using local currency. Uh, <laughs> so let, <laughs> let's see how things will turn out. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm only going to make a small quote of um, uh, an Irish uh, botanist, a uh, world um, known Irish botanist, uh, of Aris, a botanist of Irish descent, I should say, um, Mrs. Diana Beresford Greger. She lives in Canada. She is a great activist, in, uh, environmentally speaking, uh, in Canada. And... Um, she is actually involved uh, in Ireland in a native tree um, initiative. Uh, some NGOs in Ireland uh, they are involved in that. Uh, I will not. Obviously, this is not the forum to talk about it. But uh, I, uh, I believe this is the way forward. Uh, I believe, um, and our priests believe so. Uh, that uh, we should look what happens to our neighborhood and to Ireland first, because we live here, and then to the rest of the world. And my message um, to you today uh, is to plant native trees. So, and that's what Diana believes, and I'm passing that on. Thank you. I'm Andrew Orr. I'm uh, representing the Church of Ireland. I'm also on the Eco Congregation Committee. Thank you, Natasha, for giving us a plug earlier on. One of the inspirations for the Anglican Communion is in the environmental sphere is David Adam, who was for many years vicar of Holy Island in Lindisfarne, of the northeast coast of England. And he writes again and again about the need for us all to get back in touch with God's creation. And I thought these words were particularly apt. For those of us who are willing to make the journey to the edges, the world is the primary scripture, that which speaks to us of God. Before any books were written, God spoke through his creation. He revealed himself through the things of the earth. The signs were there for those who learned to read them. And these signs are there still. But so many of us today are illiterate when it comes to reading our own environment. If only our eyes are open to see and read, there is a fantastic depth to our lives and to every created thing. All things shine with the numinous. Even the common soil will still open our blind eyes if we come in faith. One of the sad comments of our times is that we teach children to read books, but we leave them unable to read the world around them. Uh, 
I suppose I've written a lot on climate change myself, but the place where I felt the real impact of that was in Takloban last year. <clears throat> what happened to the poor of the world, and that option for the poor, the tragedy that is the poor very often who suffer for the fact that we in the developed world have actually used carbon in the way we have. So my prayer is we begin to be more sensitive to the impact of what we are doing. We begin to advocate for the kind of changes and the structures that will allow us to change across the whole area of our lives because climate change affects so many, many areas. It's the way we live, it's also our transport, but all of those have to be faced up and my prayer is that we will do that and uh, we will see that life that's in the world and uh, I just thought yesterday's first reading from Acts of the Apostles where, where uh, Luke calls Jesus the Prince of Life. So the Prince of Life is in our world and it's up to us to protect it and help it to grow and develop rather than have it undermined and destroyed. Thank you to everybody. We're now going to finish with uh, another song from the Discovery Gospel Choir. And while they're coming up, I just want to say a word of thanks to everybody who's participated in this evening's event, and especially to the Dean of Christchurch Cathedral, who has given us this wonderful room to meet in this evening, and for my colleague Sorley, and also my colleague Kleena Sharkey, who put a tremendous amount of work together to, to organise the event tonight. So thank you to all of them.
comes, the first of those, is, it's called Sipayo, which just means happiness. Happiness like when in the, in the time of old, canoes would come in from the sea. It comes from a place exactly on the opposite side of the world, called Niue, in the middle of the Pacific. 180 degrees different in, 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 in latitude from, in longitude from here. And it was brought to us by a friend called Bart. Niue is a tiny island. It, there's a, about 1,500 people live there. Its highest point is 64 meters above sea level. It's not going to survive if we don't do something about climate change. And the other half of that song, This Little Light of Mine, is precisely about what we, we heard so eloquently about earlier in the evening, that each of us must feel that we can do something and must do something. And, it, and it's, 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 hard. It, it's, it's hard to keep one little light shining for, for yourself, for your neighborhood, for the whole world. It, it's hard to do that. You must have faith. And I, I, I have to say that sitting here and listening to everything and, and feeling the, the weight of the, the carboniferous limestone that this <laughs> was built on, I'm feeling the, 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 the weight of the, the trees that were lived 200 years ago above our heads and breathing the, the, the wounded air that we all breathe. I, I feel that this is a task that is, is huge. It's far too big for, for me or for, for anyone else, but yet we, we can touch it. We, we, can, we can feel the sight of it somehow. And we can be part of making things better in our little way. We can let our little light shine. And we just like to, to say that that faith, another way to express it is just, just one more song that we'd like to sing. <laughs> 